When Mark first asked me to uh, discuss uh, gatekeeper countries, I have to admit I was a little bit hesitant, not because I don't think that it can play a vital role in a comprehensive migration strategy, but because I don't think it is a silver bullet. And I'm always concerned when the United States has an issue, a problem, and tries to outsource it, to use the word that Nicolette just used. I, I am firmly of the view that we need to be in control of our own destiny and do what we can within our own borders where we don't have to be asking people for favors. And certainly, I think it's important as part of a comprehensive strategy to try to reduce illegal population flows, which I think are going to be uh, continuing in the 21st century, kind of taking the long view of things as, as transportation gets easier. But I think, in essence, as long as people can come to the United States illegally and obtain very high paying jobs and other benefits, those uh, programs are, th th those flows are going to continue. So I certainly think that um, gatekeeper countries is a piece of the puzzle, but I don't think it should ever be viewed as some kind of silver bullet to solving it. And I, I you know, the, the same issue kind of goes for, for drugs that, that we kind of, I think a lot of times we have problems in this country. We say, well, you know, really this is Mexico's problem and, and, and Mexico, you need to fix this. Uh, I, I don't think the fact that all these people are entering the United States illegally is Mexico's problem, although Mexico certainly has, you know, a lot to, to do with it. Um, just thinking about gatekeepers in particular and Mexico, I think, it's an interesting concept because until very recently, I don't think anybody would have thought of Mexico as a gatekeeper on migration issues. In historically, uh, and, and mass illegal migration, I think as Victor pointed out, is a relatively recent phenomenon overall. And then for most of the 80s, 90s, into the 2000s, it was overwhelmingly a Mexican issue on our southern border. The, the, the people who were coming across were Mexicans, and the system was kind of set up to deal with Mexicans coming into our country. One of the big changes, and I think this really started uh, in the Obama administration with the, the underage, unaccompanied minors uh, crisis in about 2014, 2015, is that... Uh, People started coming from all over the world, particularly from the Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, the so-called Northern Triangle countries of Central America, but, but really from, from all over. And actually, non-Mexicans, uh, for the first time ever, starting in the, 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 the last few years, have actually, you know, it varies from month to month, but become a majority of the people uh, crossing our southern border. So all of a sudden, we have a very new migration issue that is not kind of your father's or your mother's migration issue from, from 30 or 40 years ago. And I don't think we have the, 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 the in place the, the tools or even really the mindset to, to deal with that. And I don't think we've come to terms with that. So I, I think I'd like to focus for a moment on what happened in, in 2018, 2019, and, and, and I think some of the opportunities it opens. Because certainly as ambassador to Mexico starting in 2019, this was the way I looked at the issue to say, one of the reasons I wanted to be ambassador to Mexico is that I thought it was important for the United States to talk to Mexico in the sense of saying, this is a shared problem now. You are no longer just a migrant producing country, but you are a migrant transit country. So all of a sudden, there's a whole new set of issues for you, Mexico, and a lot of common ground for us to work together on issues that you might have seen before as a U.S. versus Mexico issue. There's still a sense in Mexico that uh, you know it is a migrant-friendly country, and you know, lots of Mexican politicians, even from the party of President Lopez Obrador, you know, still insist you know there's a human right to migration. I used to say, well, where does that come from? I thought one of the I'm a lawyer. One of the basic characteristics of sovereignty of any country is the ability to control its borders. I, I may love French culture and identify as a Francophile. That doesn't give me the right to go and live and work in Paris uh, just because I I want to. I mean, every country has uh, that 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 is the, the one of the inherent. Uh, attributes of sovereignty is the right to control who comes into your country. So I said, it's important that the discourse uh, in Mexico, which is obviously very sensitive about its own sovereignty issues, include these kinds of dimensions and include the fact that 
It is not a humanitarian or compassionate approach to be putting policies in place that encourage people to come illegally. I mean, as I think Victor mentioned, this is something that is extremely costly to people. They're, they're often basically entering indentured servitude to put up the money to come uh, to, to make this journey, which is also a very, very dangerous journey, which many people are killed. So it's interesting just to focus on, I think, the U.S.-Mexico migration crisis of 2018-2019 as kind of an example of what can be done. So President López Obrador uh, was elected in 2018, came into office on December 1st of that year. And, uh, you know, from a, a, a left-wing uh, party, new party in Mexico, and some of the elements of that party were very much uh, trying to set a different note than the United States and, and said, you know, our Central American brothers and sisters, you know, you're welcome in Mexico and we will embrace you with open arms. And so what happened, uh, caravans started forming mass migration. Even though Trump was still in the United States, uh, you started to see mass migration from Central America, uh, you know, into Mexico. But did they stop in Mexico? No, of course not. They had no intention of just going to Mexico. They used Mexico as a transit point to go to the United States. And so I think... President López Obrador then kind of had egg on his face because his kind of open border policy towards the Central American brothers and sisters was obviously just a uh, um, something that uh, that a mechanism that made it easier for people to get into the United States. This is one of the points I make when people say, "Oh, we got to address root causes." The root causes in Central America didn't change one bit before and after this migration flow. There was no hurricane. There was no coup. There was no you know, crackdown along ethnic or religious or political lines. It was simply a change in migration policy, in that case by Mexico. And I said, look, what really drives this fundamentally is just like any other human decision. People are economically rational and they make a choice you know, what, you know, how much are they going to have to spend and what are their odds of getting into, you know, into Mexico, across Mexico and into the United States and successfully getting in there. They're always making that that determination. And so I think President López Obrador's strategy in, in, in 2018 uh, unleashed this crisis. And President Trump then um, announced in May of 2019 when we started, we were starting to get, you know, 140,000 uh, people a month uh, at the border. Uh, you know, crossing, uh, attempting to cross illegally, he said, look, enough is enough. And he, uh, you know, basically said he's going to impose these tariffs on Mexico. Uh, and it's interesting, every single one of my predecessors as ambassador to Mexico signed a letter saying, oh my gosh, you can't do this. We never mix migration and, and, and commercial issues, which I thought, where does that come from? I mean, so, since when do you not use leverage that you have in a bilateral relationship. Mexico uses migration leverage all the time with us. It just seems ridiculous that we had kind of compartmentalized these these various issues in our relationship with Mexico. Anyway, be that as it may, President Trump did that. And you know, before he knew it, the Mexicans had sent a, a delegation to Washington and we worked out an agreement with them. Um, and you know, that, that, that meant Mexico was actually really for the first time in its history going to uh, take a more active role in controlling these migrant flows. Again, I think that corresponded to public opinion in Mexico that the Mexicans were not happy either that their country was getting used as a doormat by people from you know, China, India, Bangladesh, Kazakhstan, Congo, Cuba, you name it. It's like the United Nations down there on the border. Uh, so you know, I think there are lots of opportunities to work with Mexico. One of the things that was put into place, uh, you know, in, in late 2018, early 2019, was the remain in Mexico uh, policy. Uh, and basically, that was a reflection of the fact that our asylum system is broken. Our asylum system, as you know, is kind of a, a carve out to our normal migration rules. We, we have normal rules about how you can migrate legally and illegally. And then we kind of created this safe harbor for people who were fleeing uh, you know, a, a, a fear, a reasonable, well-founded fear of imminent you know, death if they were you know, on the basis of certain characteristics if they remain in their countries. Well, obviously that system was getting abused by people who were just economic migrants, but who knew what buzzwords to say so that they would get processed into the American asylum system. If enough people do that at once, you don't get a hearing for four years then. And then you were being allowed into the United States, which obviously was a huge kind of loophole to our entire immigration mechanism and was really incentivizing a lot of these flows. So Mexico agreed to a system where 
those people, instead of being allowed into the United States to wait for their asylum hearing, were, were required to remain in Mexico. What that did almost overnight is it dried up those flows. Uh, and so I think Mexicans had been somewhat concerned that they would be stuck with this, this um, you know, huge migrant population. Those fears really didn't materialize because once people knew this, again, their, their economically rational uh, cost-benefit analysis changed. And I think in this sense, Mexico may be somewhat different than Turkey and Syria because Syria really was, again, I, I don't purport to know a lot about the Syrian conflict, but at least initially there was a very brutal war going on in Syria. So some of the people might have actually fled um, for, for those reasons. There, there's no similar issue in, in, in Central America. So anyway, I, you know, th this is certainly a a um, a change. You know, once the Biden administration came in and basically indicated that it had no uh, interest in in limiting illegal migration, as far as I can tell, the Mexicans have basically given up as well. I think their thought is, hey, we're not going to be you know more Catholic than the Pope. If you guys don't care about this, why should we? And so that's pretty much where we are right now. You know, I. I've always been a little bit surprised that Remain in Mexico became the outcome because Remain in Mexico to me is a, a, a kind of second best approach where these people are in the U.S. asylum system and so they're you know just waiting in Mexico for their time to come up. It would seem to me that if you just think about asylum in terms of what it's supposed to be doing, it's supposed to be shelter you give somebody who's immediately fleeing for their lives. I mean, I think this came up in, in what Victor and Nicolette were saying that it seems odd for people to cross third countries where they don't have those imminent threats of danger and then apply for asylum in their preferred country. That seems to be more of a traditional immigration issue, not an asylum issue, which is just give me immediate shelter from the immediate risk I'm facing. Anyway, for, for whatever reason, um, in Mexico, the idea of safe third country just became political poison. Like they, they, they would not accept that under any circumstances, even though I thought, in a sense, that is more respectful of their sovereignty to say, look, you guys, you know, you, you can't, for our domestic purposes, we regard Mexico as a safe third country, and that disentitles you to apply for asylum if you cross Mexico and come here. I think that's a cleaner way than remain in Mexico. But be that as it may, remain in Mexico served a very useful purpose, and I think the Mexicans could see that as well. So, I do think that there is a lot to be said for exploring gatekeepers more as part of our migration policy. One thing I was saying to Mark just before this started, and this will be my final observation, is that it is important, I think, to recognize that Mexico can play a gatekeeping role, but it shouldn't all be on Mexico. A lot of people are, are flying in from Europe to countries like Ecuador or Brazil that have much looser visa requirements and then making their way over land uh, through six or seven countries, Colombia, Panama. I mean, there's a very narrow uh, you know, funnel for them to go through. The, the, the idea that we kind of wait until they arrive in Mexico, where we have a 2,000 mile border, to really get serious about stopping these flows seems to me ridiculous. Uh, I think this should be the number one issue in our relationship with Panama, with Costa Rica, with Nicaragua. What can they do? I mean, there's so many potential places there where these flows can be stopped and discouraged. So anyway, I, you know, I think it's something certainly worth considering, but I, I think it is a mistake to think that this is the magic bullet that will solve the, the crisis from our point of view. Thank you.